Okay, so uh, would you unpack that word when you say connected just a little more because I worry about people saying, well, yeah, I'm connected. I got I got friends, right? I, I got friends. What, what kind of one more of that, I want to throw that at Raymond as well, is connected mean to you? Yep, so I'm going to throw this back at you, Dennis, because last time I was here, I remember <laughs> that you brought up a term and it stuck with me, uh, a Waffle House friend, right? <laughs> or maybe it was Raymond, one of you did. And a Waffle House friend, as you explained it to me, is who can you call at two in the morning and say, hey, I need you to meet you at Waffle House, be there in a half hour, bring a shovel, don't tell anybody. How many How many people are showing up, right? Now that's yours and it's stuck with me because it's good, but that, that helps me understand like relationships of depth where we're not playing nice anymore, we're being real with one another. We're allowing each other to see the Whoa. good things in our life, but also the challenging things and the brokenness Whoa. in our life. Whoa. And so what we need is we need a second jetty. And that second jetty is personal disciple making that is led by the leader, right? And so part of what I believe and what we have found in Navigators Church Ministries is that if you want a second jetty, if you want a solution that's actually going to turn the tide and make a change in your church, that second jetty leads to a disciple-making culture in that church. Hello, folks. Dennis Allen again with The Disciple Dilemma and my co-host, Raymond Monroe. And today we're going to talk about what 2 a.m. Waffle House friends mean and what are relationships about and how many pastors really get discipled and the Bay Ocean story and the jetties. All that's coming from our revisit from Justin Gravitt with Navigators Church Ministry. Justin is in the marketplace working with churches and pastors. He sees it. He's experiencing it. And today he's going to help us get a grip on what's going on in the world of discipleship in the West, the good and the bad. Here's Justin. Here we go. Justin Gravitt, welcome back to the Disciple Dilemma. It's terrific to see your face on our podcast again. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be back with you guys. So as we look back on the history of this thing, it was a year ago, September, that we brought you on and you teed up some really interesting stuff, which uh, if, if I just if I just kind of give our viewers a moment to capture this, you said that many pastors and leaders and elders are aware of discipleship, but they're really not clear what discipleship really is. And they really don't have any idea what you're talking about when you make the statement, we need to build a culture around discipleship. So I was hoping that the three of us, Raymond, Justin, and I could have a three-way panel discussion today, pushing a little deeper beyond just, yeah, there's a problem, to actually try to say to everybody on the podcast, can you hear us, folks? This is not just a surface cosmetic seminar issue. This is something far deeper and far more pervasive in the church than before. Now, I'm going to I'm going to start out just before I toss I guess I'll toss the first question over to uh Justin, but I just wanted to hold this up from Navigator's Church Ministry and you'll see us putting this up on the website in a few minutes too. This is Justin's ebook on foundations for a disciple making culture. It's available out at Navigator Church Ministry. So they thought about this before. Raymond's thought about this a lot before. I've tried to think about this before when we when we put the disciple dilemma together. So Justin, to tee this up, I want to start with this question, right? Most of the folks we hear from say, well, pastors, elders, leaders, small group leaders, they get discipleship. They've been discipled. They've got all this. Why are you beating up on us as the lay people? What What's your experience, your understanding of the discipleship experience of leaders in the church? Yeah, it's a great question. So in my experience, I've been working with pastors and church leaders for nine years now. Um, it's all, it's what I do all week, every week. And here's what I've found. I found that most pastors haven't been discipled. Uh, some have, right? It's not none have, but in the ones that have fall into one of two categories. The first category is they are saying that something is discipling that I would not. So what the, often is the case is someone in their past showed individual attention to them and asked them questions and helped form them in their faith, which is an aspect of disciple making. 
And so they take that and say, well, yeah, I've been discipled. But the problem is they didn't get the reproductive element of disciple making or the call that God has placed on our lives to go and do likewise with others, right? And so they say they've been discipled. And then my next question is, well, that's great. Tell me about it. And they tell me about it. And then I ask inevitably, well, how's it going for you? Who are you discipling? And nine times out of 10, they tell me no one. Or they tell me, you know, a dozen people, which is, again, referring to a very different thing than what you and I and Raymond are trying to talk about today. So um, I'd add to that that most have no training in disciple making. The ones, whether they have or haven't been discipled throughout their seminary experience, whether they have a master's or a PhD, most have never had a class even in how to make a disciple. Mm. Raymond, you have been around the block a few times over the years as you've moved and done a lot of different business activities in different towns. What's what's your experience with pastors and leaders who have actively been discipled, as Justin's describing it? Yeah, I'm not aware of any of them that have been actively discipled. And as we've talked about discipleship being peer relationships, lifetime fr- friendships, working together. Um, certainly, uh, the last couple of pastors I've had, I've reached out to them and begun to informally meet with them in a non-threatening situation where we can just talk about what it means to be Christian in a way that's private to them. So it's not going to get back to the church and they can just relax. And it takes a month or two for them to realize that I'm not asking them for the right answer, which is what you ask a pastor for. What I'm just doing is talking about what does it mean to be a faithful follower of Christ and how do we understand this issue and how do we build culture in our church to do things. And within a month or so, they just relax and just have a blast because they have no place. They feel like they're back in seminary where they can talk about what does it mean to be Christian. Justin, let me let me just kind of toss this back over to you. What what you guys are describing to me is something that a lot of people take for granted, but is not true. There's a mythology and urban legend, which is big groups equal relationships, as opposed to the individual, the one-on-one, the mentors, the, the wingmen, if you will, the people who are following me in real life, full life. We don't get relationship in America and probably in the same degree nearly in the church. Is that a fair accusation in this discipleship deficit? I think so. I think that part of our problem uh, in the West is our culture doesn't spin us into places where we're connecting with others, right? So if you're not connecting with people in your workplace, uh, it depending on your age, right? So I'm in my mid forties, my age down, like there's not those spaces to connect naturally. Um, and the church doesn't do it well. Mm-hmm. Right? The church, you come into the church and you're there for an hour and you're pleasant and kind with people and you ask how their week was. But as far as getting in, into a relationship of depth and meaning, that's not happening in churches. I mean, by and large, right? So because of that, even this these foundational commands of loving one another, we're not practicing it. Not only are we not practicing it, we're not experiencing it from others And it's real hard to be a disciple if we're not really loving each other in relationship. Okay, so would you unpack that word when you say connected just a little more because I worry about people saying, well, yeah, I'm connected. I got, I got friends, right? I, I got friends. What, what kind of one more of that? I want to throw that at Raymond as well. Is connected mean to you? Yep. So I'm going to throw this back at you, Dennis, because last time I was here, I remember <laughs> that you brought up a term and it stuck with me, uh, a Waffle House friend, right? <laughs> or maybe it was Raymond. One of you did. And a Waffle House friend, as you explained it to me, is who can you call at two in the morning and say, hey, I need you to meet you at Waffle House, be there in a half hour, bring a shovel, don't tell anybody. How many How many people are showing up, right? Now that's yours and it's stuck with me because it's good, but that that helps me understand like relationships of depth where we're not 
playing nice anymore. We're being real with one another. We're allowing each other to see the good things in our life, but also the challenging things and the brokenness in our life. Whoa. I shared an article with Dennis about why people de-church. It was uh, two or three weeks ago. And they had looked at nuns. They looked at evangelicals who during COVID had just stopped going to church. Conservative, real Christian people. And the common reason for the people not being involved in church was nobody cared about them. Hmm. Nobody in the church cared about them at all. It wasn't like the nuns had abandoned it because they didn't think it mean anything. And then some people abandoned it because it conflicted with their views of politics. And some people dropped out because they had other busyness in their life. Virtually uniformly, it was nobody really cares about me. Nobody, there's no real community here. Now, I think that's right on. I think, you know, the listening and caring is huge. And I would even say that it's easier for me to make a connection by being the one that needs help. Because one of the things that I observe is that a lot of people are really interested in helping, Mm -hmm. but a lot fewer are interested in showing a need or presenting a need that someone can help with. Now, hopefully I can discern some of those. I get to know them and just move into meeting that need before I'm asked. But man, when I, when I reveal a need or, Hey, I could really use some help here. uh, People seem really eager to help. Right. And so for me, I found I lead with that. And then I try to come back with, well, man, you must have some, some thing that I could come help with. And then yeah. it opens them up because it kind of establishes that like we don't we don't have to pretend here like we got it all together. We don't need anything. Yeah. One of, one of the things that's fascinating to me, I work for a trade association. So I am basically a church leader or scout leader with a bunch of volunteers. Hmm. And if I need someone, if I need programmatically people to be involved in a program that's in their bone interest and important. I will put a notice in the weekly bulletin. It's our m- monthly newsletter. Okay. Expecting no one to answer. That's just to cover my butt. That's yeah. just so no one can say I didn't invite them. I know I'm going to have to pick up the phone and ask people to volunteer and recruit mm-hmm. them because they know I care about them and they know that I know they can do this particular task. Hmm. In the churches I'm in, we rarely, if ever, do that. To me, one of the biggest failures of leadership is knowing people well enough to actually reach out to them one at a time and find how to use them to advance the kingdom of God. Hmm. We are talking with Justin Gravitt with Navigators Church Ministry. Raymond and I are panel discussing with Justin some issues, and we hope nobody takes offense at the fact that these are provocative, in some ways uh, a little bit frustrating or scary as questions and as issues, but that it helps all of us to think more deeply about biblical discipleship. When we come back, we're going to dig a little further into this idea of, okay, leaders, what is it we're asking you to do, and what exactly is a culture, and how do you get it going? Stick with us. Folks, welcome back to The Disciple Dilemma. We're talking with Justin Gravitt, Navigator's Church Ministry, and we're having a conversation about what's really going on in the Western Christian world with discipleship. Again, not an attack on any of you as pastors or church leaders. We want you to understand we love you, we're praying for you, we're pulling for you, and we hope the provocative nature of the questions reveals some things that may not be quite as apparent in the world that you live in because you've been living in that world. And so, I was thinking, Justin, this might be a chance for you to give us a sort of a summary of a video you recorded on YouTube. We'll put the link up so everybody can see it right now. But it's the story about some people who decided a partial solution would fix the whole problem. Would you be willing to lay that story up for us? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the story happened. It's a true story about a place called Bay Ocean, Oregon. And it was constructed as kind of a paradise, right, for people. And they did all the things. They built this amazing natatorium, the first natatorium ever in America. And they moved a bunch of people out there. And then they realized that the ocean was starting to swallow this strip of sand where they built all this. And so the leaders got together and 
started talking about solutions. Well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Now, keep in mind, these people are are moved there and some are there all the time. Some are vacationers there, but they're trying to figure out how do we save this place that we love so much. And they talked about solutions. They con- consulted with the Army Corps of Engineers. They said you need two two jetties that would shift the tides a little bit and stop the ocean from swallowing uh, this place. And so uh, the residents and leaders talked and argued and debated. And what they settled on was, well, let's just let's just do one jetty because we don't quite have what we need for two, the money, the time, et cetera, et cetera. So we think one jetty might might work. Let's do it. And so they did it. And all the while that this jetty is being built, they're vacationing, they're enjoying the ocean, they're swimming in the natatorium, they're having dances in the evenings, having a grand old time. But the one jetty didn't work. And so all the time they're doing all that, all the normal things that they had been doing, the ocean's continuing to swallow up this place. And over time, it that's exactly what happened. All of Bay Ocean, that city was swallowed up by uh, the tides and the ocean. And the reality is, and where I land uh, in the video is, they settled for a one jetty solution when the only one that was going to work was a two jetty solution. And I think we have some parallels in the Western church. We see that there's a problem. Everybody sees that there's a problem. When we think about, are the churches churning out people that look and act like Jesus in their everyday world and helping to find and create and make other disciples who are just like that. We have a problem. And so the solution is we need to do more than what we've been doing. It's not enough to just say, well, let's just continue on and, and, making worship meaningful. Let's have worshipful experiences. Let's have sermons that are a little more meaty. Uh, We've been trying these things for decades. So that's the first jetty. That's the first first jetty. jetty. That's exactly right. right. And if we stay there, we're just like the residents at Bay Ocean, believing that somehow this one jetty solution that we have put forward is going to magically make a difference when in the past it hasn't made a difference. And so what we need is we need a second jetty. And that second jetty is personal disciple making that is led by the leader, right? And so part of what I believe and what we have found in Navigators Church Ministries is that if you want a second jetty, if you want a solution that's actually going to turn the tide and make a change in your church, that second jetty leads to a disciple making culture in that church. And the way that we get there is by having a leader that lives it. We can't lead it if you don't live it. Hmm. And then from there, we need a core team of leaders in the church. It's really a cross section of people in the church that do the same thing. They start living it. And then they watch as it spreads through the church. Would you help the church think more about discipleship? Would you help us get the conversation started to talk about the biblical discipleship Jesus gave us? Please follow us. Our website, www.thediscipledilemma.com. You can find us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and all the RSS feeds. If you'd follow or like us, you'll help us get leverage in the digital marketplace to talk about the fact that discipleship needs to be talked about. And as always, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.